Well, good morning, church. Welcome to another daily Bible reading. If you've noticed all five days this week, if you've been tracking along, I've been wearing the exact same shirt. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. It's not because I'm wearing the same shirt every day, but rather I did all five readings in, in one day. And so this has been a busy day doing a lot of uh, reading to prepare for these readings and the time it takes to actually do the reading itself. And we even had a board meeting tonight uh, with the deacons. And um, the reason why I'm doing this is to get ahead of schedule. We have a lot of activities coming up and uh, trying to get ahead to uh, get, give myself some uh, some buffer room. And I do have a conference to attend uh, at the start of October, um, another camp to speak at at the end of October, and uh, we have um, a, a political forum that's coming up uh, sometime in October as well. And uh, so there, there's just a lot of things going on and trying to get ahead. Well, let me go ahead and open us up in a word of prayer. Uh, and uh, by the way, our reading for this morning comes, uh, It's this is the scheduled reading for Saturday, September 26th. So let me go ahead and open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning and your blessings in our life and this opportunity to be able to go through your word. I pray that you would help us to understand, help us to be enlightened to your truth and to your plan and will and purpose for us and help us to Continue to grow into the image of your son that we may be able to glorify you by that result. And it is in his name we pray. Amen. Well, we're taking a look at four different chapters this morning. We're looking at the entire book of Habakkuk, which is really only three chapters. And then we'll go to the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. But Habakkuk is one of the prophets in Judah, and we have been reading as we've been going through 2 Kings as well as 2 Chronicles. We, we saw the promise of judgment from God uh, that he would exile the, um, the Judeans. Uh, well, we also have here the words of Habakkuk, another prophet during this time, and uh, we will see um, even more details about who's going to come and bring them away. Uh, verse 1, the oracle which Habakkuk the prophet saw. How long, O Lord, will I call for help, and you will not hear? I cry out to you, violence, yet you do not save. Why do you make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. Therefore the law is ignored and, the, and justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous, therefore justice comes out perverted. And so we see this cry from the prophet Habakkuk. He is observing just the sin that's all around him. And this is amongst his brethren. This is not even the nations. He is talking about his fellow Israelites in Judah. And he's saying, Lord, how long are you going to keep turning a blind eye to this? And the Lord responds, verse 5, he says, uh, Look among the nations, observe, and be astonished. Wonder, because I am doing something in your days you would not believe. If I... If you were told for behold in verse six, we see for behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that fierce and impetuous people who march throughout the earth to seize dwelling places which are not theirs. And by the way, the Chaldeans, this is the Babylonians. Um, this, uh, th th the two terms are often uh, interchangeable in verse seven. They are dreaded and feared their justice and authority originate with themselves. And, uh, and by the way, those Chaldeans, those Babylonians, they were really a subset of Assyria. But at some point they rose up and took over all of Assyria and established their own empire. And so Assyrians who were quite feared uh, throughout, um, you know, their history when they terrorized the nations around them. Um, it tells you something that they were overtaken by the Babylonians. And so verse 7, once again, they are dreaded and feared. Their justice and authority originate with themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards and keener than wolves in the evening. Their horsemen come galloping. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swooping down to devour. All of them come for violence. They, their horde of uh, faces move forward. They collect captives like sand. They mock at kings and rulers are a laughing matter to them. They laugh at every fortress and heap up rubble to capture it. Then they will sweep through like the wind and pass on, but they will be held guilty, they whose strength is their God. So this is the Lord's response that, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to bring the Chaldeans and the Chaldeans are... <laughs> are a wicked people themselves, not really all that different from the Assyrians. And in fact, verse 11, we see they will sweep through like the wind pass on, but they will be held guilty. They whose God strength is their God. And Habakkuk cannot believe what he is hearing. Verse 12, are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? 
We will not die. You, O Lord, have appointed them to judge, and you, O Rock, have established them to correct. Your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. Why do you look with favor on those who deal treacherously? Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than they? Why have you made men like the fish of the sea, like creeping things without a ruler over them? The Chaldeans brought, bring all of them up with a hook, drag them away with their net, gather them together in their fishing net, therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they offer a sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their fishing net, because those through these things their catch is large and their food is plentiful. Will they therefore empty their net and continually slay nations without sparing? And so Habakkuk is basically saying, look, Lord, you're bringing someone who's even more um, who's even more wicked than, than the Judeans that are here. Why, why are you using a more wicked nation? And the Lord responds in chapter 2. Uh, we start in verse 1, Habakkuk saying he's going to wait a reply. I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart, and I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me and how I may reply when I am reproved. So Habakkuk gives this re rebuke, and he knows that he's going to be reproved. He, he knows that he spoke out of turn. And here is the Lord's response, verse 2. Then the Lord answered me and said, Record the vision and inscribe it on tablets, that the one who reads it may run. So he's about to go on to say that judgment is going to come to the Babylonians also. Verse 3, For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens toward toward the goal, and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come. It will not delay. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by faith. And that second half of verse 4, that is a very well-known verse. It ends up getting quoted by Paul on a number of different occasions. The righteous will live by his faith. And verse 5, Furthermore, a wine betrays the haughty man, so that he does not stay at home. He enlarges his appetite like Sheol, and he is like death, never satisfied. He also gathers to himself all nations and collects to himself all peoples. Will not all these take up a taunt song against him, even mockery and insinuations against him, and say, Woe to him who increases what is not his? For how long, and makes himself rich with loans? Will not your creditors rise up suddenly and those who collect from you awaken? Indeed, you will become plunder for them. Because you have looted many nations, all the remainder of the peoples will loot you because of human bloodshed and violence done to the end, to the town and all its inhabitants. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house to put his nest on high, to be delivered from the hand of calamity. And then verse 10, you have devised a shameful thing for your house by cutting off many peoples, so you are sinning against yourself. Surely the stone will cry out from the wall, and the rafter will answer it from the framework. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and founds a town with violence. Is it not indeed from the Lord of hosts that people toil for fire and nations grow weary for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Verse 15, Woe to you who make your neighbors drink, who mix in your venom even to make them drunk so as to look on their nakedness. Verse 16, You will be filled with disgrace rather than honor. Now you yourselves drink and expose your own nakedness. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you, and utter disgrace will come upon your glory. And then verse 17, for the violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you and the devastation of its beasts by which you terrified them. Because of human bloodshed and the violence done to the land, to the town and all its inhabitants, what profit is the idol when its maker has carved it, or an image, a teacher of falsehood? For its maker trusts in his own handiwork when he fashions speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a piece of wood, Awake, to a mute stone, arise, and th that is your teacher? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all inside it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. 
And so we have that extended word of judgment upon the Babylonians. We see multiple statements of woe. It reminds me of Jesus in Matthew 23 when he pronounced, um, I think, eight woes to the scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, as he was bringing down condemnation upon them as well. And then the letter of Habakkuk really ends with Habakkuk's prayer, starting with his prayer acknowledging God's power. Verse 1, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to Shigionoth. And this is where he acknowledges all that the Lord has said. Verse 2, Lord, I have heard the report about you, and I fear. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known in wrath. Remember mercy. God comes from Taman and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His splendor covers the heavens, and the earth is full of his praise. His radiance is like the sunlight, and he has rays flashing from his hands, and there is the hiding of his power. In verse 5, Before him goes pestilence, and plague comes after him. He stood and surveyed the earth. He looked and startled the nations. Yes, the perpetual mountains were shattered. The ancient hills collapsed. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Kushan under distress. The tent curtains of the land of Midian were trembling. Did the Lord rage against the rivers, or was your anger against the rivers, or was your wrath against the sea, that you rode on your horses, on your chariots of salvation? Your bow was made bare, the rods of chastisement were sworn, Selah. You cleaved the earth with rivers, the mountains saw you and quaked, the downpour of water swept by, the deep uttered forth its voice, it lifted high its hands. Sun and moon stood in their places. They went away at the light of your arrows, at the radiance of your gleaming spear. In indignation you marched through the earth. In anger you trampled the nation. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You struck the head of the house of the, <clears throat> of the evil to lay him open from thigh to neck, Selah. You pierced with his own spears the head of his throngs. They stormed in to scatter us. Their exaltation was like those who devoured the oppressed in secret. You trampled on the sea with your horses on the surge of many waters. So we have many statements, many images there of the Lord's power and uh, the, 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 the victory that he has over everything that he does, uh, the success he has over everything he does. And then in verse 16, we see Habakkuk's commitment to exalt in the Lord, and that is to say rejoice. Verse 16, I heard and my inward parts trembled. At the sound, my lips quivered. Decay entered my bones, and in my place I tremble, because I must wait quietly for the day of distress, for the people to arise who will invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail and the fields produce no food, Though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength and he has made my feet like hinds, limp, like hinds feet and makes me walk in my high places, <clears throat> on my high places for the choir director on my stringed instruments. And so Habakkuk, while he... Remember the situation that he is in. He is seeing a lot of wickedness from his fellow Israelites. He is calling for the Lord to judge them. He realizes that the Lord is going to bring the Babylonians. He can't believe that the Lord is bringing someone even more wicked. And uh, the Lord promises that he's going to use them. Then he's going to turn around and judge them. And then Habakkuk really ends with this prayer of confidence that though he knows destruction is coming, um, he has to continue exalting in the Lord. And that's what he commits to doing. And from there we go to the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and we are returned to the words of Paul as he is writing to the church in Corinth, and he starts off chapter 7 by expressing his confidence in them. Verse 1, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Make room for us in your hearts. We wronged no one. We corrupted no one. We took advantage of no one. I do not speak to condemn you, for I have said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. Great is my confidence in you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort. I am overflowing with joy in all our affliction. And then verse 5, for even when we came to Macedonia, 
into Macedonia. Our flesh had no rest, but we were afflicted on every side, conflicts within, fears within. But God, who comforts the depressed, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And by the way, I mean, you, you can see, if you remember each of these chapters we're going through in 2 Corinthians, that Paul is making a reference, making references to a lot of affliction going on and a lot of comfort that comes only by the Lord. And so this comfort, verse 6, once again, but God who comforts the depressed comforted us by the coming of Titus and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he has comforted in you and <clears throat> by which he was comforted in you as he reported to us your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. And then we see a reference to a letter that Paul wrote to them that caused them sorrow, but it's the right kind of sorrow. Verse 8, For though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that that letter caused you sorrow, though only for a while. Verse 9, I now rejoice. Not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the suffering, for the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. And verse 11, for behold, what earnestness this very what for behold what earnestness this very thing this godly sorrow has produced in you what vindication of yourselves what indignation what fear what longing what zeal what avenging of wrong in everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter so although i wrote to you i was it was not for the sake of the offender nor for the sake of the one offended but that your earnestness on our behalf might be made known to you in the sight of god and then Paul expresses his comfort uh, by them. Verse 13, for this reason we have been comforted and besides our comfort we rejoiced even more for the joy of Titus because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For if in anything I have boasted to him about you, I was not put to shame for as we spoke all things to you in truth, so also our boasting before Titus proved to be the truth. His affection abounds all the more toward you as he remembers the obedience of you all how you received him with fear and trembling i rejoice that in everything i have confidence in you and so that brings us to the end of our reading for this morning let me go ahead and close this in a word of prayer heavenly father thank you once again for this word i thank you for just your holy spirit i thank you for the opportunity just to be able to grow in our knowledge and i pray that we would continue to do that that we would also apply these words into our lives, consider how they point to your Son, Jesus Christ, consider any ways in which we can continue to grow in the ways that we may fall short. And I know that there are many ways that certainly I fall short, and I'm, I'm certain others as well. But Father, we pray that you be glorified by this process, and we give thanks to you and pray these things in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you once again for joining us uh, this morning. Um, I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow morning when we get together for our corporate uh, time of worship. Um, hopefully I'll see you there in person or if not, um, also online for those of you who are concerned about uh, the health factors or whatever reasons there may be. Um, but uh, just looking forward to just worshiping once again. Um, thank you once again. Have a wonderful rest of the day and God bless.